Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Long War by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. So this is the second book in the series. I've been reading through it and reviewing them as I go, so I will link below to my review of the first book in the series, which was called The Long Earth. I'm going to read the blurb to you, and then I'm going to start going through and uh, just going off some of my tabs. So, The Long Earth is open. Humanity is spread across untold worlds, linked by fleets of airships encouraging exploration, trade and culture. But while mankind may be shaping the long earth, the long earth is, in turn, shaping mankind, and a collision of crises is looming. More than a million steps from the original earth, a new America is emerging, a young nation that resents answering to the Datum government. And the trolls, those graceful hive-mind humanoids whose song once suffused the long earth, are, in the face of man's inexorable advance, beginning to fall silent and to disappear. It was Joshua Valiente who, with the omniscient being known as Lobsang, first explored these multiple worlds, and it is to Joshua that the Long Earth turns for help, for there is the very real threat of war, a war unlike any fought before. And I've got to say, it doesn't feel as though, it feels as though war is kind of coming, but it doesn't even feel as though war is imminent, and so it's kind of a misnomer, because there isn't really a war going on in this. It's kind of similar to the first book, except we're exploring further and deeper into the Long Earth. I did enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it as much as the first one, which is potentially my book of the year. But there is lots to talk about here, so let's jump on in. Uh, so we start off with there's like a major case in which some scientists were studying the trolls and kind of mistreated them. Uh, so this, it says things happen quickly after that. These space cadets had tried to put down this troll, this mother, immediately. They even pulled a gun on her. But they'd been stopped by an older guy, more dignified, who looked to Janssen like a retired astronaut. And now retribution was on hold because of the attention focused on the case. Since this lab recording had been leaked, it had become an alternate sensation in itself and had led to a flood of similar reports. There was cruelty to beasts and especially the trolls, it seemed, all over the long earth. Internet and alternate were alight with flame wars between those who believed in mankind's right to do as it wished with the denizens of the long earth, all the way to putting them down when it suited, some referring back to the biblical dominion given to humans over fish, fowl, cattle and creeping things, and others who wished that mankind didn't have to take all its flaws out into the new worlds. This incident at the Gap, precisely because it had taken place at the heart of a nascent space programme, an expression of mankind's highest aspirations, and even though it betrayed a kind of insensitivity, Jansen thought, rather than downright cruelty, had become a poster case. A vociferous minority called for the federal government on Datum Earth to do something about it. And I would be right there protesting for the rights of the trolls, you know. I also think it's cool that we have the alternet now, which is the equivalent of the internet, but across the long earth. And we learn a bit more about how that works later. So this bit I think is really sad, and um, we're looking at the trolls here. Right at the start of the book. Uh, so Monica Jansen, watching the clip in her apartment in Madison West 5, tried to read Mary's hand signs. She knew the language trolls were taught in experimental establishments like this one was based on a human language, American Sign Language. Jansen had had a little familiarisation with signing in the course of her police career. She was no expert, but she could read what the troll was saying. And so, she imagined, could millions of others across the long earth, wherever this clip was being accessed. I will not. I will not. I will not. This was no dumb animal. This was a mother trying to protect a child. And then we have Sister Agnes is brought back to life. And we get this little, uh, this little exchange here. And in a black corporation medical facility on a low earth. Sister Agnes, I have to wake you again for a little while, just for calibration. Agnes thought she heard music. I am awake, I think. Welcome back. Back from where? Who are you? And what's that chanting? Hundreds of Tibetan monks. For 49 days you have been. And that dreary music? Oh, you can blame John Lennon for that. The lyrics are quotes from the Book of the Dead. What a racket, though it's Tomorrow Never Knows, which is one of my favourite Beatles songs. Turn off your mind, relax and float downstream. Uh, we also have this, this great quote here. We're going to bollocks up our second chance at Eden, even before the paint has dried. Basically because humanity is spreading across these long earths and doing what humanity does best, which is leaving a bit of a mess behind. We have these inventions in this called Twains, which I think is great, as in never the twain shall meet. And uh, they are like airships that are like kind of like commercially available that you can book your seat on to go through worlds as a more as an easier way of stepping you know obviously developed by the black corporation here we go here we ha hear some more about the alternet nowadays even the news was dispersed across the long earth by the airship fleets a kind of multi-world internet was growing up known as the alternet on each world they passed through the airships would download rapid update packets to local nodes to be spread laterally across the world and would upload any ongoing messages and mail and when airships met away from the big datum Valhalla Spine Route, they would hold a GAM, 
a word resurrected from the days of the old whaling fleets, where they would swap news and correspondence. It was all kind of informal, but then so had been the structure of the pre-step day internet on the datum, and being informal it was robust. As long as your message had the right address, it would find its way home. Tying in with Moby Dick, the kids on the world where Joshua lives, they're putting on a play, The Revenge of Moby Dick. Joshua couldn't suppress a grin. It's good stuff. Wait for the bit where the illegal whaling fleet gets its comeuppance. The kids learn some Japanese just for that scene. Come on, we've got seats up front. Look who's come to join me as well. And it was indeed a remarkable show, from the opening scene in which a narrator in a salt-stained oilskin jacket walked to the front of the stage. Call me Ishmael. Hi, Ishmael. Hi, boys and girls. So it's almost like a panto Moby Dick. And then we have basically what the government of the Datum Earth have done. The letter was from the federal government. Everybody with a permanent residence beyond Earth 20, west or east, with assets back on Datum Earth, was having those assets frozen and ultimately impounded. With mom ill in bed, dad had to explain all this to Helen. Words like assets and impounded. Basically, it meant that all the money dad and mom had earned before upping sticks for their trek into the long earth and had left in bank accounts and other funds back on earth to pay for stuff like mom's cancer meditations and for stay-at-home brother Rod's care and for a college education for Helen and sister Katie if they ever wanted it had been stolen by the government. That was dad's word. It didn't seem too harsh to Helen. Does it seem too harsh to you, Biggie? No. I like this little paragraph here. We learn a little bit more about what happened to the Brits. In that, Ken was typical of his nation in a way. The British experience of the Long Earth had been in the beginning mostly a painful one. Such had been the early exodus from these crowded islands, particularly from the battered industrial cities of the North, Wales and Scotland, regions isolated from the increasingly complacent city-state that was London, that a rapid population loss had led to an economic crash, even a collapse of the currency briefly. They had called it the Great Bog Off. Do you just try and bite me? Saw you in the viewfinder. I like this as well. So we're going to hear about uh, Douglas Black, who is the kind of the founder and owner of the Black Corporation. And uh, there are some parodies there with both with sort of Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. I think you'll see them if I read this paragraph aloud. Yes, everybody knew Black's story, the elements of which had become as familiar, it sometimes seemed to Nelson, as the nativity. It was a classic American narrative of its kind. It had all started when Douglas Black and his associates had set up just another computer company with the help of Black's late grandfather's oil money bequest. That was the early 1990s. Black had only been in his mid-twenties. From the beginning, Black's lines had included such much longed for by customers products as computers with long battery power and fault-free software, machines that were your partners, not just a gadget for extracting money from you, not just an ad for some superior future version of themselves, machines that seemed mature. And from the beginning, Black had begun to make philanthropical donations of various kinds around the world, including a scholarship program in South Africa that Nelson himself had benefited from. Why did you just bot me? And uh, Nelson starts to kind of look into what he calls the Lobsang Project. He doesn't really know what it is, but he wants to investigate. For example, as he had drifted somewhat aimlessly through the periphery of the information cloud that surrounded Black, he had started to notice how often the Lobsang Project was mentioned. But it was always a dead end in any search, a link to nowhere. Of course, that name meant big brain in Tibetan, which showed that somebody in the Black Corporation had not only a sense of humour, but also some skills when it came to languages. But Lobsang was a personal name too, and slowly, Nelson had come to envisage Lobsang as a person. A person to be tracked down. Him and his project. And that happens later on in the book. I like this little term here as well, so... Nelson was pretty sure that he'd seen just about everything that Joshua Valiente had brought back from the extraordinary voyage of the Mark Twain. The Black Corporation, in a gesture typical of Douglas Black, had dumped Godzilla bytes of data from the voyage into the archive of any university that wanted it for open public access and study. Godzilla bytes. Nelson had an irrational dislike of petabytes, the recognised term for a particular, and particularly large, wadge of data. Anything that sounded like a kitten's gentle nip just didn't have the moxie to do the job asked of it. Godzilla bites, on the other hand, shouted to the world that it was dealing with something very, very big, and possibly dangerous. I've just realised as well that the Twains are also named after Mark Twain, and the Mark Twain, the original airship that went out and uh, did the travelling. They go to uh, the town of Valhalla, which is in the High Megas, which I believe is any world above like a hundred thousand or a million or something. And Valhalla is this community that was mentioned in the blurb that's kind of sprung up by itself and doesn't really recognise like US jurisdiction. At Valhalla, Thomas Kiangu was waiting to greet them with a big handwritten sign, Valiente. Another old buddy of Joshua's, Thomas was around 50, with long black hair pinned back in a ponytail and a wide grin splitting a dark, reasonably handsome face. His accent was thick Australian. Greetings, Clan Valiente. Welcome to Earth West 1,400,000. Well, officially it's 1.4 million plus 13, since our founding fathers were stoned when they first got here and lost count. 
but we like to round it down for the TV ads. Good to see you again, Joshua. Hey, I just reframed myself without looking because the cat left. We have a quote here from Helen, who is Joshua's wife. A book. Nobody reads books now, or at least not new books. Because really, most people, when they want books, they want like the encyclopedia because, you know, electricity isn't really a thing on the stepwise worlds, but an encyclopedia can contain huge amounts of information. We have these people called comas as well, who are kind of like hunter -gather gatherers who go from world to world, and they're actually being used to support Valhalla. So uh, Roberta Golding here says, uh, Valhalla is a city supported by comas, hunter gatherers. The logic is elementary. Intensive farming can support orders of magnitude more people per acre than hunting and gathering. On a single world, a coma community, even if natural resources are rich, would necessarily be spread out, diffuse. The concentration of population needed to sustain a city would be impossible. Here, it is sufficient for the comas to be spread out not geographically, but over many stepwise earths. Over a hundred parallel Valhallas left wild for the hunting. The city is the product of a layer of worlds, each lightly harvested, rather than the product of a single intensively farmed world. This is intensive gathering, a uniquely post-stepping urban solution. Which I think is again a cool, a cool thing where you can see the authors have thought through what the world they created would have led to. We have this little insight as well, which obviously as a vegan makes me a bit sad, but I suppose it's necessary. I don't know, I think they could just grow plants and stuff, but whatever. Kangaroo farming was becoming commonplace, even in the datum. Kangaroos were efficient as food animals. Pound for pound, a roo needed a third the plant material a sheep did, a sixth the water, and produced almost no methane. Roo farts were parsimonious. Thomas didn't object for any rational reasons. It just didn't feel right. So we have a just a little throwaway reference here to a, a character, a crewman, who tells this kid his name is Boson Higgs, which Helen didn't believe for a second, but that's a nice little reference to the Higgs boson particle there. I uh, like this little reference here as well. The Long Earth hadn't been much used to the Dutch at first, since on all the stepwise worlds, the landscapes they had spent centuries carefully preserving from the sea were still drowned. I can see that why that would be a problem, no pun intended. We also find the case of Angela Hartman. So uh, it happened a week ago. She was found by her family, stoned out of her mind. Sorry. She wouldn't wake up. She was in a kind of coma, took days to come out of it. We know who did it, who gave her the drugs and got high with her. And we know who committed the murder. So basically there was this like guy who was going around and he was just traveling around through the, you know, through the stepwise worlds and whatnot. And there's this plant that's extremely addictive and highly hallucinogenic. And because he was high on this plant, he gave some to the girl. So the girl's father killed him. And so now they have to decide how they're going to, you know, follow, pursue justice, bearing in mind that there's no real legal system over in the stepwise worlds. Here we go. We have a little bit more here about that. But also, uh, I don't know, I like this paragraph in general. Uh, so uh, Mac saying, it's a bit, a bit hippie. Maggie stared at the medic. Where did all that come from, Mac? My grandfather left me a complete collection of the whole Earth catalogue, a load of 60s and 70s counterculture stuff. I got quite interested in it, you know. Some of their values were laudable. But when it comes to the meat and potatoes, the secret to building a home in a place like this isn't about ideals and theory, and not about getting high. It's about hard work, alongside a sense of humour, and the goodwill of your neighbours, and putting your back into the future. But what you've got down there, I think, is the seed of tragedy. Along with Margarita Jar from Biology, I analyse that lovely little flower that grows everywhere in their woods. Addictive and hallucinogenic like there's no tomorrow. Growing like a weed. But Mac, ye gods, are we going to have to send a drug enforcement agency unit to every settlement? They have to work it out for themselves. It says here, that's how it got resolved in the datum in the end. After step day, there was an explosion in the drug trade with stepping pushers. There was no way to police it. In the inner cities, the cops called, pulled back and, well, let's say they let natural selection take its course. I think what's cool as well is that stepping basically leads to the dissolution of the communist Chinese government and leads to like a new democratic society, as I suppose it would have to. Uh, we also get, so jokers are what they call worlds that are kind of uninhabitable between the different steps. And um, Chen laughed at their reaction. Butterfly world, what the Westerners call a joker. Of course, an ecology needs more components than just butterflies. Nevertheless, here in this part of China, butterflies are all that come to greet us. We have no idea how this has come about, what is different here. Yet here we are. You see, Roberta Golding, I told you that we'd be counting butterflies. What do you think? At length, Lieutenant Wu Ye Se said, it would certainly be hard to demonstrate chaos theory here. They were all silent as they worked that out. Then Jacques was the first to laugh. So the idea behind chaos theory is that even the flap of a butterfly's wings across the other side of the globe can have like huge implications where we are on weather patterns and stuff. And uh, basically the army is traveling and uh, they all left behind their steppers because they thought they wouldn't need them, which means they've got stranded. 
Then one of the guys asked his buddy if he had some water to spare because he was getting thirsty in the heat, but the other guy didn't. Turned out none of them had brought water either, because that was all supposed to be in the drop. Not even Nathan, not even the lieutenant. There was a stream not far away, you could hear it running. But these were all Dayton-born types who had drummed into them from childhood that you didn't drink the local water. Okay, so there's a downed ship, and I'm going to read you this little paragraph. She was called the Pennsylvania. She'd been caught in a dust storm when she tried, cautiously, to cross the Joker, and then one of her helium sacks, maybe already carrying a fault, split open at the sudden expansion caused by the heat of the Joker's dry air. The leak had been quick, but the crash slow, relentless. It must have been a terrifying experience. The gold dust passengers saw the wreck now through a veil of wind-blown dust that hissed against the windows, the remnants of the storm that had killed the ship. From the air, it was a 600-foot reef, already half covered by drifting red sand. And so, of course, they go off on a rescue mission there. We have a lot of these firsters, they're called, um, and they're kind of the terrorists who are against this world-hopping thing. Their strategies have evolved. They soak up the propaganda. They stay quiet under the radar. They take to carrying around stakes. Joshua asked, stakes? That's their jargon for the weapon he carried. Like staking a vampire, you know? A stake of iron for a stepper. Very hard to police. Uh, it says down here, um, Sally grunted. I'm hearing that there are countries on the Dayton where governments are doing that kind of thing purposefully, surgically fixing iron clips to your heart or an artery. The idea being that then if you did try to step, the iron wouldn't go with you and it would kill you, basically. And they're talking about Sister Agnes here. Um, and and he said, Joshua says he, he ought to get some flowers for her grave. Was she the type who would want flowers? Joshua smiled. She always said no to flowers. Then she'd accept them and grumble about a wicked waste of money and would keep them in her study until the petals dropped off. I've known people like that. It's nice to surprise them with flowers every now and then. And uh, Joshua goes to stand at her grave and uh, he sees a figure standing across the road, a woman in a nun's habit, just standing, apparently watching him. He crossed the road. He couldn't see her face. She looked youngish. Can I help you, sister? Well, I've been away. Her voice was a soft brogue. I only learned of Agnes's death recently. Would you be Joshua Valiente by any chance? Your face is familiar from the news. Oh dear me, where are my manners? I am Sister Conception. Agnes and me, we went back a long way. In fact, we took our vows together. I knew she would become a force in the world. Always knew it, even though she could be a mouthy madam. Joshua stayed silent. Sister Conception took a long look at Joshua's face. It isn't working, is it? Well, if you want me to think that you aren't who you really are, no. I'd know her in the pitch dark. I can remember her walking through the dormitory every night before standing at the door and turning the light out. The click of that old bait light switch held together with glue because there was never any money for a rewiring. The way she made us all feel safe. Besides, she never was a good liar. Or any good at an Irish accent. And this is obviously Sister Agnes and Joshua. They are meeting one another again. And then uh, she's talking to uh, Lobsang about her new body. And she goes, she goes, who ordered those? I'm sorry? Look, even before my bosom headed south for the winter, I assure you it wasn't that size. Can you please tone it down a little? And uh, later on, the voice of Lobspang spoke again, gently. My apologies once more, but this is a very delicate procedure, what you might call the end game. I've been working on your revival for three years, and now it's nearly done. Sister Agnes, dear Agnes, you have nothing to fear. Indeed, I expect to meet you in person after breakfast tomorrow. While you wait, would you care for some music? Not more bloody John Lennon. No, no. Knowing your taste, what is your position on the works of Bonnie Tyler? Although I don't know what Agnes has got against John Lennon, because I love Lennon. Agnes is like, why have you brought me back? Is it just because of Joshua? And Lobsang says, I need an adversary, Agnes. Somebody to tell me when I'm out of order, when I'm being inhuman, or being too human even. It seems to me, given all that Joshua has said about you, that you are uniquely placed to be that person. And she goes, you brought me back to life to be your conscience. This is ridiculous. But she agrees to do it anyway. All right, and then Joshua and Agnes are sitting together and uh, Agnes says she's writing a book and Joshua says, a book? What about the, spir the spiritual benefits of female masturbation? Joshua sprayed coffee. The male heads turned again. Her eyes glittered as if she was ready for the fight. We've been at war with the Pope and his cardinals since the Second Vatican Council. Just because we think social justice is more important than opposing abortion or same-sex marriage. Just because we reject their patronising patriarchy, which is why nuns become nuns in the first place, one way or another. Oh, I can't wait to get back into the fray, Joshua. And with this new body, I'm never going to run out of steam, am I? I'll be the Energizer Bunny of militant nuns. What's an Energizer Bunny? Oh my dear child, you have so much to learn. I'm not going to tell you what an Energizer Bunny is. You probably know. We, I like this bit here, the, uh, this conversation between Agnes and Lobsang. We could try the Chorin test, said Lobsang. 
Oh, machines have been able to pass the Turing test for years. No, the Turing test. We both pray for an hour and see if God can tell the difference. And she had to laugh. I love this as well. So the trolls communicate through singing and they have these super complex harmonies. And we have this little paragraph here. Maggie learned a lot of other details about the trolls from the Pagels, such as what they wanted from humans, it seemed, was entertainment, variety, new concepts. Show even a juvenile troll something like a lawnmower with bolts big enough for troll fingers to work, and he or she would carefully take it apart, keeping all the bits neatly in a line, and then put it back together again for the sheer joy of it. Juliet Pagel had experimented with human music. A good gospel choir would have trolls sitting in rapturous silence, as would 1960s close harmony groups like the Beach Boys. And then the people on the ship, the Franklin, are talking about whether it's a good thing that they've adopted the trolls. I mean, Maggie said to Mac and Nathan, in Star Trek they put a Klingon on the bridge. And a Borg, said Nathan. Well, there you go. Not a Romulan, though, Mac said. Never a Romulan. The trolls are staying, Maggie said firmly. Never a Romulan. And then they get this device that can translate the troll's language. And uh, so Maggie's there. Now she pointed the troll call at Marjorie. Female here, watching. No mate female, meaning not understood. Tentative translation, a female choosing for her own purposes not to have a male. They meant her. Everybody's a relationship counsellor, Maggie grumbled to herself. This is interesting as well. Uh, then at breakfast the next day she called the crew together. She looked carefully around them and picked out Jennifer Wang, one of the marine detachment, whose grandparents she knew had come from China. Jennifer, you spent a long time with Jake yesterday. What did he say to you? Wang looked around, somewhat embarrassed, but she cleared her throat and said, A lot I couldn't understand, but it was along the lines of far from home. It creased me up. I mean, I'm a Chinese American and proud to be a citizen, but it's in the blood. How did the big guy know? Because he's smart, Maggie said. He's intuitive. He's sapient. I like this as well. So they go to near where the gap is, which is a gap between the long earths and they're using it for kind of space exploration. And we have this little introduction. This, this is the first uh, paragraph in a new chapter. We don't think of this world as earth west two million plus change or whatever, Frank Wood said. We think of it as gap east one because the gap is the center of our universe, not the datum. And a strange kind of world this is, right? Almost empty of humans. Whole continents nobody's even set foot on. We basically live off fishing and a bit of hunting while we build spaceships. We're a tribe of hunter-gatherers with a space program. Okay, so I like this. They've gone off to visit the sort of uh, interworld space agency. It says, the company even had its own logo, a roundel with a thin crescent earth cupping a star field, the gap space name below, and above, a corporate slogan. There is no such thing as a free launch. Joshua had once told Jansen that that was a line of lobsangs. I like this little reference here to some sci-fi history as well. He stared at her and laughed. I think we're going to get on, you and I, Lieutenant Jansen. Sorry, I know I get carried away. Look, did you ever read Robert Heinlein? Basically, it's like that here. You really can build a backyard rocket ship and fly to Mars. What's not to love about that? All these worlds are ours, including Europa. Sorry again, another nerdy reference. Also, the trolls start to go, um, and it says here, J Sally says, uh, they're not gone from here particularly, not yet, but I bet the drift away has started, here like everywhere else. They're abandoning the Long Earth in general. Look, you know about the Long Call. All the trolls everywhere sharing information. Well, it seems they've reached some kind of tipping point. Tipping point about what? About us. About humans, our relationship with them. All over the Long Earth, they're leaving. Leaving the human colonies anyhow, it seems. Any world where there's a significant human presence. They're not dumb animals, you see. They learn and they modify their behaviour. And now they've learned all they need to know about us. The uh, trolls are singing uh, the rare old mountain dew and Joshua says, what's that? The song the trolls are singing, an old Irish folk song. You know, it's possible to date the first contact with humans of any given troll pack by the songs they sing. In this case, to the late 19th century. Do you remember Private Percy? He was in the first book. I've carried out such an exercise tentatively. The result is a kind of map of natural steppers in the pre-Willis Lindsay era. Though, of course, it's not always possible to track back the trolls' own wanderings. And uh, the, t the trolls, the way they use music, uh, they tie that back to Galileo. He used music as a kind of clock to time his early experiments in mechanics, pendulum swings and so on. And, of course, the trolls' songs carry information. Even a simple disharmony can carry a warning, but there's much more to it than that. And then uh, Joshua goes, they're still singing about getting drunk on Irish moonshine, as far as I can tell. The core song is only the carrier wave, Joshua. I've done some acoustic analysis. There are variations in pitch, rhythm, even the phasing of the song scraps that carry information about how far away the find is, how high a quality the food is. Other scouts will pick up on that, go and check it out, and come back with a confirming report, or maybe a contradiction. It's an efficient way for the pack to explore all the local possibilities, and soon they'll settle on a selection. 
Often they'll switch to another key or another song altogether to signal unanimity and then they step away. Honeybees work this way. When they need to find a new location for the hive they send out scouts who come back and dance out the data. I like this little thing as well on troll rights and how it relates back to animal rights. Well, they, they don't comfortably fit the old categories, do they? Of human versus animal, the distinction through which we believe we have dominion over nature. It's as if, I think, we'd found a band of homo habilis, something between us and the animal. In some ways, the trolls are animal-like. They don't wear clothes, they have no writing. They have no language that's quite analogous to our own. They don't use fire, as even homo habilis probably did. And yet they have some very human traits. They make simple tools out in the wild, poking sticks, stone hand axes. They have strong family bonds, which is why it's so easy to trap a troll mother if you have her cub. They show compassion, even to humans. They do have their own language in their use of music. And they laugh, Joshua. They laugh. The distinction between human and animal is the clincher, you see. You can own an animal. You can kill it with impunity, aside from feeble anti-cruelty legislation. You can't own a human, not in any civilised society, and killing a human is murder. So should we extend human rights to trolls? I would argue yes. Also to animals, but hey-ho. They go to see a church as well called the Uncut Brethren, and I wonder if that's a reference to circumcision. Okay, then we get a new species of animals as well, and these are called the kobolds, so obviously we're going for like mythological names throughout. But the reason is that sometimes these mythological creatures accidentally step into our world, so we've built legends around them. I love this little quote here, um, this is about Roberta Golding. Humanity, she once said, in an answer in a philosophy exam taken when she was 11 years old, was nothing but the thin residue left when you subtracted the baffled chimp. Yep. Pretty much right. And we think we're at the top of the food chain. I like this as well. So the, the gap between Earths, they found travelling west, but here they're travelling east, which is why they're going with the Chinese. Shortly afterwards, the ships made a longer stop next to Earth East 2,217,643. Here they found a gap, a break in the chain of stepwise worlds that made up the long Earth, where the relevant Earth had been removed. Roberta quickly pointed out to Jacques that the first western gap discovered by Joshua Valente had been at around Earthwest 2 million. No doubt from the similarity of those two numbers, there was some conclusion to be drawn about the nature of the great tree of probabilities that was the Long Earth. I should point out here as well, the ideas of East and West are arbitrary, especially in the Long Earth. It's, you know, it's just what people use. But it's also interesting because even though the labels are arbitrary, the Chinese tend to head East and the Americans tend to head West. Who'd have thunk it? So I like this... Uh these couple of paragraphs here when they're on this Chinese airship that can hop uh, between worlds. And then the flickering seemed to fade away, the worlds merging into a kind of continuous blur. The sun, paler than usual, hung in its patient station in an apparently cloudless sky that took on a deep blue colour, like early twilight. The landscape below was misty and vague, the shapes of the hills grey and dim, littered with patches of forest that seemed to grow, shiver, pass away. The river that had been writhing jerkily across the landscape now spread out as if flooding a wide band of ground with a silvery grey, and the ocean coast too became a broad blur, the boundary between land and sea uncertain. We have passed the flicker fusion threshold, Roberta murmured. Yes, Chen cried. We are now travelling at our peak rate, an astounding 50 worlds per second, worlds passing faster than the refresh frames in a digital screen, faster than your eye can follow. At such a rate, we could traverse the great treks of the first pioneers of the Long Earth in little more than half an hour. At such a rate, if we kept it up, we could traverse more than four million worlds per day. I love this little quote by the AI cat. The nice thing about artificial intelligence is that at least it's better than artificial stupidity. The cat also points out that he was built to the finest standard specifications of the Black Corporation's robotics, prosthetics and artificial intelligence divisions. Whereas your turbine was built for the government on a low bid contract. And there's this thing amongst astronauts apparently, where they say like sometimes they remember when they're heading into space on a ship that they are literally strapped to all these rockets that were built by whoever quoted the government the lowest. <laughs> then they meet another race that they call uh, kobolds. So now we have trolls, elves and kobolds and dwarfs, I believe as well. But none of them are actually like the mythological counterparts necessarily. It's just like a label that semantically we use to describe them. Uh, and the kobold, he wants uh, a stone that each soul of man sings the holy music, men that sing after death, like Buddy Holly. And uh, by stone that sings, he means uh, a, ca a cassette tape, basically. And it's, uh, Bill says on the radio, it's the album you wanted. The Kinks of the Village Green Preservation Society. Excellent. So obviously I've already talked a little bit about how some of the creatures take their names from uh, folklore. And we have this little explanation here. If they have had contact with mankind, you might think we would know about it. Well, in a sense, we do. 
It's remarkable how much human folklore can be explained away if you postulate humanoid races that can move stepwise at will. And uh, then we have a little bit more information on the, the uh, kobolds, but also if you're a Stephen King fan, I think you'll find this quite cool as well. Uh, and if not, I'm not going to tell you why. You'll have to figure it out. And so we come to the kobolds. These creatures may indeed be the kobolds of myth, the source of German legends of mind spirits, which are also known as types of gnome or dwarf or bergman lion, little mountain men. They would infest metal mines and would be heard rather than seen. They could be helpful. Their knocking could guide human mindness to rich ore seams or warn them of danger. In Cornwall, England, they became known as Tommy Knockers, and they would sometimes steal human artifacts. I don't know how to pronounce this. Giugors. Giugors. And they would sometimes steal human artifacts. Giugors, like mirrors, combs. They were evidently fastened by human material culture, though they could not emulate it. So they meet this kobold, and uh, the kobold is the one they gave the kinks thing to, and he says, you have more kinks? Uh, but they're kind of holding it back as like a bargaining chip. And uh, his name is Finn McCool. It's not his kobold name. It's the name uh, that he was given by humans. I like this little line of dialogue here from... Well, this whole paragraph I'll read it out. It gives you some more context on the kobolds. Horseshit, said Bill. No such worlds. He's just trying to wheedle more out of you, Joshua. Aren't you, Finn McCool? You can't shit a shitter, you little shit. Listen, Joshua, you have to understand what we're dealing with here. These are slippery little buggers. They get around quick, they seem to be able to use soft places, they talk all the time, and they trade, with us and each other. But they're not human. They don't do business the way we do, grubbing for wealth, making as much profit as we can. And then he describes them as basically like big feckin' ugly magpies with trousers on. And then uh, Joshua saves Finn McCool's life, and in return, McCool tries to kill him. It's cobbled logic, Joshua, like human honour, but in a distorting mirror. You shamed him by saving him when he was supposed to be saving you. I like this little update on what's going on in Wyoming as well. Alas, there was a shortage of cowboys nowadays. Wyoming folk having been particularly quick to head for the new stepwise worlds where land was free and government interference infrequent. It was almost reassuring for Nelson to read on a truck bumper sticker, in this neighbourhood we don't just watch. There's just a little throwaway reference to GK Chesterton, uh, which I'm not going to mention. It's just like, part, like one of the clues along this kind of... I guess you'd call it like a, almost like a treasure hunt as uh, Nelson's trying to find Lobsang and Lobsang's help left these clues behind. Small speaker on a pole by his driver's side door demands, identify yourself please. So as Nelson thought it over, he leaned out and said, I am Thursday. And I had no idea what that was all about, but then we get an explanation here. First things first, Lobsang said, we are safe and discreet in this place, which is one of several such support facilities I own across the world. Indeed, the world's. Nelson, you are free to walk out of here any time you wish. But I would prefer it if you never spoke about this meeting. Well, I believe a fellow Chestertonian will be discreet. Grant me the liberty of confirming your favourite novel, The Napoleon of Notting Hill, is it not? The source of the railings quote. Exactly. Personally, my pick is The Man Who Was Thursday. Still an excellent read and the precursor of many spy romances over the years. A curious man, Chesterton. Embrace Catholicism like a security blanket, don't you think? Uh, Lob Sang also says... Um, some call me a deranged if highly intelligent supercomputer, but I know I have a soul. It's the bit talking to you, correct? And I have dreams. Do you believe that? Just very cool stuff on like the nature of this AI slash human hybrid. And then they meet a, a cobble called Snowy and he says he studies them and then says, You, he said to Sally, crotch stink human. I like this little bit as well, another little musical reference, so and here Jansen saw trolls the first time they'd arrived in this world, say for Mary and Ham. A party of a couple of dozen, perhaps, were working their way along a dry stone wall, evidently making repairs. They sang as they worked, the usual beautiful multi-part harmony applied to a lively, jumping melody. Ham, who had been napping on Mary's lap, woke up now and climbed upon his mother's shoulder to see. In his immature piping voice, he sang back phrases, echoing the song. Sally listened hard. I'd swear they're singing Johnny Be Good. I love this little description here as well of uh, Jansen. So it says... Uh, what there was, however, was a rich melange of scents, which even Jansen's battered old cop schnozzle could detect. Battered old cop schnozzle. Amazing. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a big Alsatian there, because they're basically these beagle creatures as well. And uh, so Sally says, that dog is a datum dog. Something to do with you, McCall. Not me. Another cobbled seller. Popular here. They like big na males. Sex toys. And then uh, <laughs> this kobold is talking about music. Uh, is it a troll? And then this troll talks about music and says, Trolls happy here. Trolls like beagles. Beagles like trolls. Troll music fine. Human music are shit. 
Beagle's ears better than human. Human music are shit. That's what my father kept telling me, Sally said. All downhill since Simon and Garfunkel broke up, he said. Oh, sorry, they were Beagles, I think. So Beagles like music. Yeah, oh, yeah quite, I don't know. Beagles and Trolls, they both like music. There's a lot of music in the book, really. We have a quote here about, um, about the kobolds. Females rule males. Same with humans. Yes, said Sally. Some human males know it, too. Yeah, I suppose probably true. Uh, we, we learn what's a, a, a cobbled de delicacy as well. He said, look. Brian leaned forward and picked out a pink blob from the central bowl. Unborn rabbit, cut from the womb of its mother. Fresh, delicacy. He rested the embryo between his teeth, bit down, and sluiced the blood into his mouth, like a connoisseur savouring a fine wine. Then there's this awesome little, little sentence too as well. Um, I suppose you're right, and I suppose we will never know what is what. Roberta sighed. So many worlds, so few scholars to study them. If only we had laboratories to produce self-replicating scientists to explore all the worlds. Ah, but we do. They're called university campuses. Okay, we have some missing footage and I'm coming at you here from the future. But I don't think it matters too much. I don't know what, like, I can't go back through and just refilm it because I took all the flags out as I went. But I think there's enough in this video for you to get a gist for what I thought about it. As for my rating, I gave it a 4 out of 5. It wasn't as good as the first one, but I did enjoy it. And the rest of the reviews for the rest of this series will be coming soon. So there will be no shortage of these videos. And they're super long and take ages for me to edit. Because I have a lot to say about these books. So there we have it. That's what I thought of The Long War. As always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. Let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.